the other side of the coin. I'm a professional hunter and trapper. I work for the government. I know how to kill wolves. Have I bought a license to kill them? The first year I did, just to have a collector's item. Do I have any desire to kill wolves now? Absolutely not. I've handled 300 live ones. I don't need a dead one. Okay, uh, we'll try and move through this fairly quick, so I'm gonna depend on you to read these slides and uh, <laughs> get the gist of it. <laughs> but there's some mighty unhappy people uh, because of the wolf reintroduction. And by the way, this fellow, Bob Fanning, ran for governor in Montana this past election. You'll be happy to hear he was in the top 1% of the one bottom 1%. <laughs> okay, here's another. Uh, if you're desperate for reading, and I'm not recommending these sites, but you almost get a taste of things, you need to go to a site like globalwatch.org and my friend Toby Bridges. He does not care for me either, I don't think, but nonetheless, there's Toby's uh, take on things. Um, this is the beginning of a long letter to uh, Defenders of Wildlife and to uh, Western Wildlife Conservancy uh, by M. David Allen, President and CEO of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, which is a elk conservation <coughs> group. Um, I was a member of that for many years, and uh, M. David Allen and I had a disagreement because I feel like Elk Foundation should have stayed out of the politics, and they didn't. Uh, so I quit, and he told me, don't let the door hit you in the hiney. <laughs> but anyway, again, uh, in his opinion, worst wildlife uh, management disaster since the destruction of bison herds, bringing wolves back on the landscape. Um, Scott went into some of this, but uh, essentially there was an estimated, uh, we got a typo there by the way, that's my fault. Uh, there are about two million wolves estimated to be on the uh, North American continent from the Arctic Circle down to Mexico City. Uh, probably humans and wolves are two of the most widely distributed land mammals on Earth. And uh, you can see by 1908, we had them down to a couple hundred thousand wolves. And in the West, by the 1930s, we, we eliminated them. And the last wolves in the lower 48 states were holdouts up in northern Minnesota, where they estimated three or 400 of them survived. So you can see, when humans decide to eradicate or eliminate an animal that's in their way, uh, they were very successful with the wolf. Um, what was the problem? Well, European settlers, we, we started in the east and kind of went west, and uh, as you can see, you know, there was truly a fear of wolves. And I can't go into all the details, but you've heard Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Pigs and, and on and on, the, uh, werewolves, so on and so forth. Uh, and then livestock grazing was probably the most important factor. Uh, we brought our livestock from the east coast to the west coast, uh, drove cattle and sheep in here. Uh, during that time, we eliminated the deer and the elk and commercially hunted out uh, many other species that uh, wolves and other predators depended on. And so, uh, obviously, to some degree, they did shift over and eat livestock because they had to stay alive. Uh, you read a lot of Native American history. Uh, they had more of a coexistence uh, uh, philosophy about wolves. Uh, certainly, um, they killed wolves, used their parts in ceremonial uh, uh, displays. And sometimes, you know, an Indian needed a wolf kill to feed himself, and sometimes wolves got the leftovers from an Indian kill. Uh, but there was not this uh, eradication mentality. Um, Scott also alluded real quickly uh, about the uh, reintroduction. We, we did the wolf reintroduction in 1995 and 1996. After we wrote an environmental impact statement, I say we, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, that uh, EIS was completed in 1994. In 1995, it went to Hinton, Alberta, Canada, just east of Jasper Park, uh, captured wolves there the first year and relocated them into Yellowstone National Park in central Idaho. And then the second year, we went to Fort St. John, British Columbia, Canada, just off the Alaska Highway. And uh, we did that again. We shipped down 66 wolves on a Forest Service cargo plane during those two years. Uh, 35 went to Idaho, 31 went to Yellowstone, 
The ones in Yellowstone were put in uh, uh, holding pens to acclimate them. The ones in Idaho hit the road running. We opened the cages, let them go. Both methods worked well. And uh, I've had myself, I want to uh, throw in another uh, one of my uh, sarcastic comments. Um, you'll read a lot about the Canadian gray wolf, just not the gray wolf. Uh, if you look at the uh, wolves listed under the Endangered Species Act, they're listed by their species, not their subspecies. We brought down Canis lupus wolves from Canada, the same source of wolves that would have inhabited the lower 48 states eventually if they came back on their own. So I took the liberty and named them Canis lupus irregardless. They're here, they're not going to go away unless an act of Congress determines that. And uh, we can sit and argue about subspecies all we want, uh, but we got a couple thousand wolves on the ground here, and a gray wolf is a gray wolf. Uh, this is the uh, population graph to just give you an idea. You can see there were a few wolves around uh, from the 1930s, almost immeasurable. Key thing was there was no viability. We, we have no evidence wolves were breeding in the lower 48 northern Rocky Mountain region where we did this reintroduction. Uh, notice 1995, 1996, uh, this talks about uh, northwest Montana is the natural population. Uh, those are the wolves that were immigrating and recolonizing from Canada on their own. Uh, we have nothing to do with that. And then uh, this is a greater Yellowstone area, talking Yellowstone, this is central Idaho. Yeah, 95, 96 reintroduction, you can see that the wolves did the rest. And uh, we have uh, an estimated 1,700 to 2,000 wolves in this region of the United States now. Uh, again, this, this is up to uh, 2011, the 2012 report by the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, but more so now by the states. Should be coming out, uh, should have been out in the month of March, but I haven't heard that it's come out. So anyway, going back to 2011, uh, this is roughly how many uh, wolves we had, 287 packs, 109 breeding pairs. Uh, when we talked about the reintroduction of wolves, we were talking 30 breeding pairs, 10 in each recovery area, equitably distributed over the landscape for three consecutive years. So instead of 30 packs, we have 287 packs, um, and breeding pairs, I take that back breeding pairs. We needed 30 breeding pairs. Uh, you can see we have, I have to do the math, now. almost three times as many as we said we needed. And so we've been accused a lot of moving the goalpost. You said there would only be this many, now you got this many. Uh, if you want to go back to the history of the reintroduction, the Fish and Wildlife Service was tied up in lawsuits almost up till today. There are still lawsuits today. Too many to talk about State of Wyoming was one of the culprits. Uh, they didn't want to play the game and write an acceptable wolf management plan for the state of Wyoming. They resisted the reintroduction. They resisted uh, doing this plan that was accept acceptable to the service. And essentially, this drug on for years. And Idaho and Montana, when they reached recovery, were unable to really do anything because they're kind of like Siamese triplets. Uh, the, whatever you do in one state has to happen in three states. But if you, here, here's probably the key message you'll get from me today. Wolves can live anywhere if you don't kill them. They can live in Iowa cornfields. As long as they got food and uh, shelter and water, they can live. Wolves are very prolific. They're very resilient. And uh, I'll point out in a slide or two later, their ability to disperse is the key to their success. Okay, real quick, uh, just give you an idea of uh, where wolves are today. Uh, if you're a pro-wolf individual, and you can cry in your beer all day about how bad things are, you know, we're persecuting them, we're killing them, we're hunting and trapping them. Uh, I tell people, look at the range. This is because of conservation efforts in the United States to protect wolves. Their range is south quite a bit. Up here in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, we got a couple thousand wolves here. Midwest, probably 5,000 plus wolves there now. So those are all pluses. Uh, success story, in my opinion. 
And down here, we're also struggling with the Mexican gray wolf, which is a, a different little subspecies of wolf. They, they introduced those wolves from seven captive animal stock three years after we did our reintroduction. And to this day, they've still only got 75 wolves in the wild. And they spent, I think, over 20 some million dollars trying to do that. Tremendous resistance down there, mostly by the livestock industry. Uh, they don't want wolves back in that country. And yet, this is truly an endangered wolf species uh, with only 75 wild animals that are in the wild. And then, of course, we've got some captive facilities. Okay, I mentioned the recolonizing from Canada, uh, but I want to just talk to you about dispersal and connectivity. These were two of the essential critical elements of, of successful wolf recovery. <clears throat> we brought the wolves here, uh, you see them two dots growing, that's uh, Yellowstone and Idaho. Uh, from that stock, you can see now that uh, we're getting gradual dispersers moving out, radiating from the core reintroduction areas. And we even had a secondary effect here of wolves going to Oregon. And then uh, we had, I think you all heard of OR7 down in Northern California, the lone wolf. He was there for about a year, but he just doubled back and came back into Oregon because he couldn't find any other wolves to hang out with. But again, that dispersal mechanism by wolves is what makes them very, very successful. And the connectivity is what the Fish and Wildlife Service was hoping for that all these different meta populations of wolves uh, would genetically uh, find each other. Okay, here's another one. Uh, some of these are gems I had to grab from the paper because they say it better than me. Ever since uh, the day we talked about reintroduction, <coughs> we had congressmen who were, you know, just obsessed with the idea that wolves are going to kill kids at a bus stop, and we're still talking about that today. <laughs> And it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Human health and safety, we've had two people in the last decade killed by wolves. One student up in Saskatchewan, Canada, teacher in Alaska. I just want to make one point. Uh, before, during, and after the wolf reintroduction into the lower 48 states, there's an estimated 60 to 65,000 wolves in Canada and Alaska. Notice where those two were killed. They were, those people were killed in an area where there's 65,000 wolves that have been there probably for centuries. Nobody's been killed below the border in the lower 48 as a result of the reintroduction or wolves below the border. Can they kill people? Absolutely, they can kill people. So what do wolves eat? <clears throat> there's kind of the smorgasbord that we have in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana, and that's principally what they prey on. Um, point out real quick, um, their main prey are, are, are wild, uh, you all know the term ungulate, right? Okay. Um, what does a wolf, how much does it eat a day? Uh, wolves can eat 10 pounds per wolf per day. Some of wolves can eat 30 pounds per wolf per day. Sometimes they just uh, carry it in their gut, go back multiple feedings. Sometimes they eat a lot of meat, go up on the ridge and puke it up in a hole and hide it for a, a day when uh, they might be hungry. On the average, they kill 12 to 22 elk-sized animals per wolf per year. Uh, I just kind of take the mean and you know just talk about maybe uh, you know, 16, 18 elk-sized animals. The 12 versus the 22, it's seasonal. When, when elk are in their prime in the spring, summer, uh, got a lot of nourishment, they're hard to catch. Got dry ground, they can run fast, uh, they're in their full health. When uh, wolves can kill up to 22 elk per wolf per year, that's in the winter when they're post-holing in deep snow, the bulls are stressed out from the rut, and a lot of them are just stressed out from severe winters, uh, lack of nutrition, and they become more vulnerable. Uh, down here, uh, constantly, we are criticized for talking to students saying they kill the, the infirm, the sick, the weak, the young. That's what they do. They kill what they can catch first. It's obvious. Do they kill healthy elk? Absolutely. When do they kill them? 
when they start getting in weak condition, when they become vulnerable, snow, uh, and so forth. And you can even talk about livestock. You know, they're vulnerable because we domesticate them, we take away their ability to protect themselves, we put them in fenced pastures, uh, and so if you put your livestock out where they can't escape, uh, they become vulnerable prey too, and once in a while a wolf will kill one. Okay, here's another long-winded uh, deal here, but uh, this just broke, as you can see. What did I publish? Here? Another typo. 2013. This just came out. Wyoming, who, if you read about what the governor had to say for the last several years since wolf reintroduction, we got to get these wolves knocked down or they're going to eradicate our elk herds in Wyoming. We got to do something about it. Uh, Wyoming just set a new record, killed more elk than they've ever killed since they've kept records. And they had a 46% success rate, almost one out of every two hunters that went out in Wyoming shot an elk. So what's the problem? Did we get that red? Okay, I'm um, going to jump over here to a little bit to livestock. This is a table out of the, uh, it used to be the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's uh, annual Northern Rockies report, but now the states of Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Oregon, and Washington uh, put it out as, as state agencies, and they compile it into one report. But if you look at this bottom uh, row here, this summarizes uh, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. And all right, top line cattle, uh, this is almost 25 straight years. About 1,500 cattle, those numbers are probably a little higher now. About 3,000 sheep. Uh, dogs took out uh, 144, I think the dog numbers are up to uh, about 153. And then of course, just jump down here to wolf skill, about 1,517 or so. And that's an old uh, graph, that only takes you to 2010. Another typo. I threw this together this morning. Point B, let's jump ahead one. Here's roughly what you're talking about per year, confirmed livestock loss. Now are there other ones? Are there possible kills? Sure. Are there missing livestock? Yes, there are. Uh, but the, the, we've been keeping track since uh, wolf uh, recovery began in about the mid-1980s. Point being, 130 sheep per year, and sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. But uh, with sheep and cattle both, that's about one quarter of 1% of the livestock population in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana. You're talking about sheep every year in these three states, 850,000 range ewes go out on the range and have lambs. Uh, talking about the cattle, every year about six and a half million beef cows go out on the range and have calves. And this is what we're talking about for livestock loss. Is it bad? If it's your cattle, yes it is. If it's your sheep, sure it is. And if we back up, uh, I wish I had my updated one, I got grabbed the wrong one. Bottom line is the numbers are about the same. For every beef animal that goes down, we've killed a wolf. Because that's this is government take. It has nothing to do with hunting and trapping by sportsmen. Uh, we've been accused of reintroducing wolves dumping them on the landscape and leaving people high and dry to fend for themselves. No, uh, government uh, has taken probably well over 2,000 wolves because of livestock damage. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart because that's what I did most of my career, uh, and especially when I was the wolf specialist for uh, USDA Wildlife Services and uh, worked with the US Fish and Wildlife Service during the uh, wolf recovery period for the first decade. And this is so important that uh, I still, I just finished training nearly 300 state, federal, uh, tribal, and county folks in the state of Washington where they're starting to get wolves back. And it's really important because so much of this livestock ends up dead, but about five out of every hundred livestock uh, are actually killed by predation causes. The other 95 or 95 percent, whatever you want to call it, die from birthing problems, disease, uh, lightning strikes, poison vegetation, accidents, uh, vandalism, you name it. There, but there's many things that kill livestock 
uh, much more important and much more concern than predation. And one of the things I really try and drive home today is taking photographs because uh, with our new phones and our new uh, ability to take pictures, we could take a thousand pictures of an investigation and you can push a couple buttons and delete it all when you're done. Okay, remember this. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, uh, you're going to hear a lot about the Echinococcus tapeworm. Somebody, anybody heard of it yet? It's out there. Okay, Echinococcus tapeworm is, is one of many parasites that wolves have. And I got to remind you, so do raccoons, and foxes, and coyotes, and elk, and deer, and moose, sheep. And you can see it, it's all kind of uh, all tied together. But the, the, the anti-wolf movement, I just give them that broad term, uh, have testified in front of uh, our Idaho legislature that these worms are going to kill all of us. Just a matter of time, we're all going to die from these worms going into our brain and into our bodies. And yet I work with dozens of colleagues in Canada, which is where these wolves came from, by the way, and I've asked them when I go up there, I says, you guys got a lot of people dying of tapeworms up here? And they go, no. Well, we've been warned about your dirty, filthy wolf. <laughs> okay, uh, another one I know is verbose, but sometimes you've got to read it to get it all. But anyway, uh, another blog if you're interested. Tom Remington, Black Bear Blog. He's out there. Uh, you will not find a much better source of vitriol about wolves than this individual. And he refers to them as stinking and disease-ridden canines. But again, these guys have their following, they have their audience, and they pump this stuff out daily, all over the web, goes all over the country, probably all over the world. Point making, I'm making yet, get the gist of this, wolves are doing great, but what's the problem? Well, this can sure contribute to the problem. Everybody get that red? Got the gist anyway. Okay, I spent about uh, 33 years in the wilds of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. I've been in wolf dens. I've personally caught about 300 wolves and worked with colleagues who've caught many more. Um, None of us have been attacked by wolves. I've never had even a scary moment with a wolf in a trap or outside of a trap. When we encounter wolves using telemetry and sneaking up on them and counting pups and everything, <clears throat> they always run away. Point being, uh, this is a true cover from outdoor life. We, as soon as these guys started to go out into the world of wolves, uh, the hunters now are having a whole other uh, experience. They're all being jumped by wolves, fighting wolves off with uh, wood bats, and uh, just having these horrible experiences out there in the woods. And I, I don't know where they're hunting, but uh, I haven't been able to get a wolf mad at me yet. <laughs> but anyway, uh, is there a problem? Uh, wolf recovery's problem, I think, it, it, we're back to, what do you want to believe? I mean, if you really want to think wolves are bad, they can be bad. You want to think they're really, really good? Uh, they can be good. I'm right in the middle. I, I don't think they're particularly good. I don't think they're particularly bad. They're just wild animals out doing their thing. Kenny and I have got this together. Because this is really about what it's all about. Dr. Dave Beach uh, in Biological Conservation 2012 just came out with a really good paper. And uh, he sums it up in his paper, and I stole his little line here that uh, they're neither sinners nor saints, but they can be if you want them to be. Well, I challenge most of you, uh, probably all of you, if you follow this thing, uh, have you heard the Idaho Department of Fish and Game say anything good about wolves? Anything comes to your mind? And I thought challenge you in the state of Montana or Idaho or Montana and uh, Wyoming. Uh, nobody wants to talk about anything good about wolves. But you can go to Yellowstone, and Yellowstone Park will tell you a lot of good things about wolves, because it's kind of a natural laboratory. 
If you haven't been to Yellowstone to watch wolves and elk interact, you're really missing out on a show. Uh, even Dr. Dave Meach says there's probably nowhere in the world that you can go and see nature in the raw happening as it's happening in Yellowstone. And so uh, there's a good display here where, where people from all over the United States, all over the world can come and watch wolves function. Uh, you can watch this ecosystem function. function. And, um, and I don't have time, but uh, Dr. Ripple and Dr. Dr. Betchka from Oregon State University did a study looking at the trophic flow in Yellowstone. And there's a real belief that the willows and aspen are making a comeback because of the presence of wolves moving elk around. Uh, in 2005, there was a study done in Yellowstone where uh, tourists spent about $35 million on tourism in the park. One of the principal reasons people came there and spent that kind of money was because of wolves. But do the states of Idaho, Wyoming, Montana consider that? Uh, it's really not something anyone talks about is turning wolves into something for the public to view. So uh, this is really, I think, the expect expectation the public had uh, during and after the wolf reintroduction and recovery effort is that uh, some thought we're going to have wolves all over the lower 48 states again. They were once here, we killed them all, now we put them back and they're in their rightful spot. Uh, the states had other plans. They look at wolves as a renewable resource, a harvestable animal, and uh, anything above the 300 minimum population and 30 breeding pairs, uh, that's all, uh, you know, good. So uh, this is what we're going to talk about now is, is uh, should we be hunting and trapping wolves? And again, uh, as a professional biologist, I'd say, yeah, we can hunt them and we can trap them. Uh, do they have to be hunted and trapped? Not necessarily. Uh, there's consequences from hunting and trapping them, and there's consequences for not hunting and trapping them. But anyway, uh, a lot of people were shocked that we would ever think about killing a beautiful wolf and yet, uh, there's a slide that uh, is typical of Yellowstone these days. Uh, how many of you followed the delisting of the wolf? Anyway, uh, here's kind of a step-by-step -step process. They were delisted in April 2011. And instead of the conventional way of delisting them after you recover them and, and you go through all these steps, um, we delisted them, there were lawsuits, and we relisted them. And then uh, we delisted again, there were lawsuits. So finally, Congress attached a budget rider to a budget bill, and it's probably the only time it's ever been done in the history of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, they attached one animal, the gray wolf, to this budget bill, and in order for the government to function and get its budget, uh, the wolves had to be delisted at the same time. That's how it happened. So are wolves delisted? Yes, they are. They're delisted uh, in the Rocky Mountain states and they're delisted in the Great Lakes region of Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. Okay, uh, again, if I was pointing fingers and picking on people, are the fish and game agencies doing a bad job? No, I think fish and game agencies are doing what they have to do politically. Um, when I went to college, you learn about biological carrying capacity. How much, how many of a certain species can live on the landscape uh, with the available habitat, water, shelter, and all of the requirements they need. Today, we're managing a lot of species based on social carrying capacity. It's not about how much the habitat will hold, it's how much you are going to tolerate, or the ranchers are going to tolerate, or the sportsmen. And so, most of this wolf management now is filtering down through the legislatures who are telling the fish and game commissions and the fish and wildlife or fish and game biologists um, how they're going to manage these animals. They put the sideboards on it, and so the states pretty much have to follow suit. So are we managing them scientifically? <clears throat> Perhaps. Are we managing them politically? Absolutely. So anyway, I put these up as samples. Some of these bills went through, some didn't. But the legislatures, whether you're talking Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Michigan, Washington, Oregon, 
uh, all of the state legislatures are really coming up with some wild bills because they're trying to get these wolves under control. So even in Montana, just recently, in the last week, they were trying to get a bill passed to allow hunters to put silencers on their rifles so that the gunshot wouldn't scare away the other wolf when they killed the first one. Luckily, they voted that down, and if I lived in Montana, I would have been happy that that was the outcome. If you don't know it, we do have an Idaho wolf disaster bill that the governor signed a few years back to protect you while your berry picking was one of the examples. <laughs> I can protect you from wolves. Now, I always worry more about bears biting me when I'm berry picking, but, but anyhow, uh, we went and listened to this, uh, the testimony before the uh, committee that reviewed this. Uh, and guys come in and talk about the kind of caucus worm being hit with a lawnmower and sprayed into the air and worried about it going to kill their family. Um, and recently, uh, we had one legislator down in southeast uh, or, uh, Idaho wanted to pass a bill where he could stake his dog out alive and wait for the wolves to come and try to kill it, and then he was going to shoot the wolves. That bill didn't pass. Anyway, there's like a whole bunch of these if you want to go back and look through them. I just took a few samples here. Um, are we hunting and trapping them? Yes, we are in Idaho. Uh, opens around August 31st, closes around March 31st. When I say around, uh, Idaho has extended the wolf season into June in the northern part of the state. And I, I, I'm being uh, vicious when I say it, but uh, maybe you get yourself a puppy rub this year instead of an, an adult wolf rub trophy. Uh, how many wolves can each of you kill in the state of Idaho if you want? Each one of you can kill 15 wolves a year now. Idaho is very liberal. How many hunters and trappers are getting that many? Very, very few. I talked to a biologist in charge of wolves a couple, three weeks ago. He estimated a couple of trappers he thought had killed about six apiece. So again, here, here we've got the lawmakers. You can have 15. Maybe next year you can have 25. I don't know. But the point being, I really think the hunters and trappers have about so much capacity to kill wolves. And I think one or two guys are tickled pink with a wolf if you get it. They're not that easy to get. But if you think all these sportsmen are going out here and everybody's going to get 15 wolves apiece, you're kidding yourself. Because you drop from those couple of guys with six or so, uh, the next successful ones, I believe, are killing about two apiece. So again, uh, all this hunting and trapping going to wipe the wolves out? I don't believe so. I, I just, and the take of wolves from last year in Idaho to this year in Idaho, I should say from last season, which was 2012, 2011-2012, this year, you know, going from August to March, you're talking 2012 to 2013, <clears throat> but the take of wolves has already dropped off from the year before. Why is that? Maybe there's not as many wolves. Maybe the wolves are smarter, but I, I think sometimes maybe sportsmen are smarter. Like, how many wolf pelts do I need on my wall before I've got enough? So, uh, anyway, gives you an idea of... Uh, what's going on out there legally. State of Montana right now, you can take three wolves per person up in, in Montana. Wyoming, I think it's still one. Okay, and then there's uh, conservation groups. Uh, I haven't picked on them out there, and uh, uh, I'm no more on the extreme, let's protect them all side than I am, let's kill them all side. Uh, there's a lot of conservation groups, wolf advocacy groups out there uh, just asking for reason and sensibility, and uh, what is that? Well, we can talk about that in a second because I'm not sure uh, what that means to different people. But anyway, this, here's a score sheet uh, that this conservation group in Oregon keeps track of, and, and just give you a rough estimate. But anyway, since we've delisted them there in, in April, um, what day was it? Uh, two years ago. 14. April 14. 14. Anyway, uh, been about 1,147 wolves killed. Is that tragic? Depends which side of the uh, uh, aisle you're sitting on. Um, <clears throat> scientists estimate you gotta kill about 35% of your wolf population, uh, of a viable wolf population a year to, to make inroads into that population or stop it from reproducing. 
Anything less than that is, uh, will be uh, compensated for by the wolves breeding and having puppies. So uh, we're up to about 612 wolves out of the population of a couple thousand. So what is that? It's way below 35%. How many puppies will wolves have out of a population of about 2,000? Uh, I'll bet you we'll have a good three to 500 pups born again this year. So is it a renewable resource? Yeah, it is. It's just a matter of how, what you consider a wolf. Is it a live, breeding <coughs> animal species that, that's like humans, and there's a mama and a daddy and babies, and uh, they like to be happy and, and uh, reflect a lot of the same qualities that humans have or are they a commodity to kill for trophy and hang on the wall? Uh, I get in trouble, but I really think, uh, do we have a whole problem or a people problem? <clears throat> right now, I think we have a people problem, and we gotta work through this. Um, it's gonna take a while because uh, um, people wanna quarrel about this yet. Uh, nobody want, I don't think anybody wants to solve this quite yet. Uh, both sides kind of want to win this fight, and I still believe the only logical common sense solution is going to be right down the middle when, when the dust settles. And there you go. Questions, Ricardo? So if we did manage to hunt them all out before, why won't, why won't we now? If the legislature goes crazy enough, you never know. Um, there was really no protection for wolves when uh, settlement occurred. Uh, and probably one of the principal tools to get rid of wolves by the 1930s was poison. We really don't have poison at our discretion right now. Uh, in the predator, tr predator control field that I worked in, uh, when toxicants were mostly banned in about 1972, we went to aerial hunting a lot now. So we've got helicopters and airplanes that can uh, uh, do a tremendous toll on predators, including wolves. But uh, if the legislatures want to keep reaching for extremes, um, we can probably hurt them pretty bad. And one of the uh, contingency requirements with the delisting of wolves is that uh, there, there has to be some kind of adequate regulatory mechanism in place to assure that wolves are not uh, eradicated. And, and the states right now are kind of being, have their feet held to the fire that they must maintain approximately 152 wolves minimum in each state in about 15 breeding pairs. And the states say the most horrible thing could happen to them again would ever, the federal government would take control of wolf management again. So uh, the states assure us this isn't going to happen. Um, so do you think that uh, wolf population growth will uh, start slow eventually is prey for lack of veteran like license out of their free energy? I think I didn't put some slides in here again. Um, I was going to point out that with the Wyoming, I showed the Wyoming slide, but uh, Wyoming is estimated to have 20 to 40 percent above management objective elk herds in their state. State of Montana last year, quote by the chairman Bob Reem, who's a wolf scientist who's on the Fishing Game Commission of Montana estimated 12 to 20,000 elk over management objectives in the state of Montana. Going into this hunting season prior to August of 2012, Idaho guessed or estimated they had 21 of 29 hunting units in the state of Idaho that were at or above management objectives. Uh, right now, the estimate is there's over 1.2 million elk in the United States, lower 48 mostly in the West. So again, there's a lot of food out there. And so then there's this uh, attempt to make us think that if we don't watch these wolves closely, that the elk are gonna disappear or, or we're gonna uh, you know, eradicate, exterminate elk population. Uh, Wyoming, I think, demonstrates, of course, they have fewer wolves than, than Idaho or Montana, but 
Uh, we've got a lot of elk out there, and so I personally, the biologists, don't think we're ever going to get into that uh, issue of not enough game to feed the wolves. And there will still be a wolf or elk to hunt, you know, by sportsmen. How are those minimum levels of wolves chosen? Are they arbitrary, or it seems that they should be linked to the number of undulates, not some random value? Good question. We've monitored wolves with radio collars since the reintroduction. Every wolf we released from Canada had a radio collar. Uh, another one of my jobs was in my area was to put collars on wolf packs. And we've monitored wolves probably closer than any species on Earth, uh, as far as right out in this western U.S. Uh, it's going to be more difficult to manage wolves by knowing these numbers because uh, I don't have all the figures off the top of my head, but it uh, costs us a couple thousand bucks to put a collar on a wolf and it takes a dollar bullet to take it off. So uh, a lot of the collared wolves are being shot, and there's no law against that. Uh, there's no uh, uh, stipulation you can't shoot a collared wolf. So I think it's going to be tougher for the states to show how many wolves they have. Uh, also, when we delisted wolves in Idaho, um, through the state legislators and congressional people, we had about a million dollar federal budget that we handed through to the state to manage wolves. By 2016, I am told that all those federal dollars will disappear. And so it takes money to collar wolves and count them. And I think, again, uh, the states do have to demonstrate some ability to give the Fish and Wildlife Service the assurance that uh, that they aren't being eliminated to a dangerous point. What kind of proof were you talking about earlier between how exactly you show that a uh, livestock was taken by a wolf? Like, what is classified as proof of that, like photographic or otherwise? Well, due to the limit of time, I didn't bring all that with me today, but I can tell you because that's what I spent my career doing. Uh, wolves have a signature the way they kill pretty unique compared to mountain lions, black bears, and, and other predators. The wolves normally bite livestock in the webbing under the front legs, in the groin areas, and down the hind legs. Uh, mountain lions attack over the top, usually neck bites, throat bites. Uh, bears attack over the top into the back, shoulder, and spinal areas. And of course coyotes, uh, they can only kill sheep sized animals and calves for a short time before they outgrow them. And so it's, it's knowing the signature of the different ways the predators kill and looking at that closely and looking, of course, for tracks and struggle sites and just the whole style of killing. And so uh, when you're out there, you, I'm, I was looking for wolf damage, but I also could determine when other predators were involved. <clears throat> and we're looking for massive trauma. We're looking for trauma inflicted when the heart's beating so we're looking for uh, blood, we're looking for hemorrhage, we're looking for bloodshot tissue, and all the indications this animal was alive and breathing and had blood pressure at the time the trauma was occurred. Do you have any sense, following up on this, of how many elk are, are killed by wolves versus cougars? I can answer in a roundabout way. In Idaho, it's estimated or guesstimated, whichever way you want to call it. <clears throat> we have about 750 wolves in Idaho from the best estimation that we can have. And I think it's a little lower than that this year. The Fish and Game will tell you they have approximately 3,000 mountain lions, approximately 20,000 black bears. And if you read about the natural history of black bears and mountain lions, you will see that they're very effective killers of fawns and calves. So by sheer numbers, those predators most likely kill far more prey species than wolves do proportionally. And there's a study up in Ravalli County, Montana, that they're doing right now, that uh, year before last, so the fishing game was really targeting wolves in that Dur Valley County area because of the declining elk herd. They put a whole bunch of radio collars out on elk. Number one predator taking them down was not the wolf, it was a mountain lion. 
So you get sort of a measure predator release effect when the wolves aren't there. Yeah, you know, and then you get into the compensatory and additive uh, discussion too. You know, would you know the wolves killing some that the lions would have killed, and so there is some additive effect of having wolves on the landscape along with those other large predators. Lady right there in front of you. Um, so I don't understand how you real well, but I, I think there's there's different rules for when you can hunt cows versus an elephant versus the males. It doesn't matter, but there's no rules like that for wolves, right? They can hunt any of them anytime. Yeah, when the season's open, you can kill a newborn pop far as I can understand. Right, so does that make a difference that they can, with predators, does it work the same way as it does? Well, it, we've, uh, let, we'll back up to coyotes, which are probably the right. most widely distributed. Um, we've had war on coyotes since settlement too, and actually they're probably thicker now than they were oh, yeah. when we started. Right. So, it so it, a lot of it gets down to your uh, psychic, you know. No, I think the wolves are going to be successful. I can't even imagine a hunter who would go out after the normal closing March 31st and continue hunting wolves. I mean, who would go out and hunt down wolves? The pelts, you know, they start to lose their fur now, so they're really not of any trophy value for the adults. Uh, and so now you would literally be, they breed in mid-February, they have their pups in mid-April. So we're about two weeks away from the peak birthing of wolves. So again, um, it gets down to um, how do you look at this? It, biologically, the wolves can sustain themselves even with people out killing them into March and April. But you are gonna be you know, killing breeding animals, and if you kill a lactating female that first month of the pup's life, well, those pups most likely will perish without milk. After that, other adults can raise them when they are weaned. Um, I was just wondering, what, what are the concerns that some conservationists have is um, the lack of lactation, that lack of the possibility of genetic diversity within populations being threatened, not, not only due to things like kind of things like habitat fragmentation as well as like urbanization. Um, and I was just wondering like would you say that that is, uh, is something to consider like there being a threat to genetic diversity within populations of wolves? Or is it at a, at, or is it a level where it's actually fine and it's not that huge problem? But from what you know? One of the reasons, probably the principal reasons that we did the wolf reintroduction where we did was was the uh, huge complement of lambs where we put wolves. They, they picked the Idaho uh, <coughs> Church Wilderness in Idaho because of this vast landscape of federal lands, low livestock numbers, high ungulate numbers, and uh, picked Yellowstone for the same reason. So I think wolves right now are are safe, you know, from the fragmentation concept because uh, they're moving into Washington and Oregon. Uh, there's, they, Washington knows they have 50 plus wolves, they've actually counted, and same with Oregon. They're guessing more they have 100. And each, just a week ago in, in uh, Washington, they just discovered another wolf pack much further west. So I think the wolves have uh, plenty of latitude to even expand, expand their range. If they ever go to Colorado, look out. I mean, there's 300,000 elk in the state of Colorado, and there's no wolves there. So think what that population of elk could sustain for wolves. So I, I you know, if we just maintain uh, sensible management of wolves, uh, I can understand why the state, you know, the state looks at Canada and Alaska and go, well, gosh, there's no holes barred in Canada. You know, livestockmen can kill them year round. Uh, they hunt and trap most of the year. Uh, they can take them anytime they think they're a problem, and I think Canada and Alaska is killing about 10% of their population. So uh, down here in Idaho, for instance, uh, we want you to kill 15 wolves. That's great, but I don't think uh, there's very many people out there capable of, of accomplishing that. So I think the wolves are, are stable now, uh, and, and they're safe. Could there be more? Oh, absolutely. Like I said, there's a lot of country out there but politically, I don't think we're going to allow them to go to those places. 
So what would a sensible management plan look like in your office and your experience? What, what are the sort of cornerstones and foundations of a sane, sensible plan? A sensible thing to me would be let's hunt them. Uh, I would, if I was Solomon, <laughs> I would start hunting them in November and I would call her quits. Uh, you can hunt them until the end of March. They're probably good yet then. And then let it rest. But the politicians won't let it rest. We're going to get more of them. And next year we're going to do this, this, and this to get them. And it's just sort of this, uh, I mean, the West has gone through change. And so I think it's sort of to uh, lash out at the fact that these states really didn't want wolf reintroduction. Idaho especially. I mean, they're on record from the beginning. We don't want them here. And after they were here, they said, we want them removed by whatever means possible. And so there's one thing worse than a wolf. It's a federal wolf biologist. You, know, <laughs> you put them here. We didn't want them. So I think the seasons aren't that unreasonable if you just let it rest. I mean, we don't rub salt in the wound after bear season's over or mountain lion season's over and say, we didn't get enough of them. We're going to kill this many more. We're going to extend the season even further. Uh, but I think people are angry politically that this happened. And so, uh, and I could sit here and start this connect the dots. You know, wolf reintroduction was not done because they were never endangered in the first place. It was done to take away our guns. It was <laughs> done to end hunting in North America. Yada, yada, yada. And uh, so this is what we're struggling with. And I just keep reminding people, in my opinion, wolves are here to stay. We're going to have to learn to live with them. Livestock producers are going to have to take more responsibility. I mean, obviously, it's, it's not that I'm trying to force them to do other things, because you can't force them to do anything. But the bottom line is, you can be smart about this, or we can just keep on fighting. And right now, I think everybody wants to fight. Do cougars and bears take many sheep and, and cattle? Uh, proportionally, no. Uh, and then we can get into uh, another talk I could talk two hours about is non-lethal. But one of the great inroads we've made in protecting livestock from predators is guard dogs. Uh, the concept, you know, the old country, in Europe and Asia and that, they use guard dogs. Uh, we started using them in the lower 48 here in about mid-1970s. And now most, I'd say I'll probably 99 and 9 tenths percent of your sheep producers have guard dogs. Some couple, others a half a dozen. Uh, one ranch up here by Weezer, they probably have, uh, through with their, with their seven bands of sheep or so, they have about 60, 65 guard dogs they have to feed. But putting these guard dogs out with the sheep, <clears throat> Uh, and, and bigger numbers was because of wolves. But while they're doing that, uh, a lot of sheep producers tell me they've diminished the effect of mountain lions, black bears, and coyotes. So it has helped, I think, with predation by using those methods. Um, in your book, you talked a lot about how, like, in the beginning of wolf reintroduction, we want to state federal agencies that were very against it. Would you say that, like, as it's progressed more, that mentality has changed within those agencies, or is it still pretty against having there at all? Well, I mentioned in my book, uh, working for wildlife services like I did, uh, tongue in cheek and, and factually both, we were the hired gun of the livestock industry. We we're a federal agency paid for by the taxpayers of this country, and yet uh, wildlife services takes it very serious that predators aren't going to kill livestock, and if they do, they're going to kill those predators. So in the agency I work for, um, there was this protective nature. Even though you're a federal employee being paid to taxpayers, those ranchers, it was real personal. You're not going to let those predators get them. And like going back to what I said earlier, state folks, uh, state biologists are walking on eggshells. They can't really say too much positive about a wolf so they just kind of follow orders and uh, manage them best they can. So uh, I think there's a lot of folks that would do things different if they had the choice. I'm lucky because I'm retired, so I can mouth off now. 
where a lot of other people can. But there are a lot of good people out there, and, and even like when you talk about all these blogs too. I mean, it's a, it's a, I call it a small group of people who keep this vitriol going. And I think more and more people who hear it long enough are going, ah, I can't handle that anymore. Um. Like when there was predation up in one area where uh, we have a place, there was it was kind of a, there wasn't a huge attempt to match the. I mean, they couldn't really figure out which animal did it, so they just killed an animal to to kind of make people happy. Was that is that how it works, or are they? Is there an effort to try to find the culprit, or could that even be possible? Most people, <clears throat> most biologists and most federal trappers, I think, are honest people. And I think most people try to look for the, the real cause. But the agencies have some bad apples in them, like all agencies do. Uh, and that's why I keep trying, uh, you know, I'm retired and there's people say, why don't you just retire and shut up? <laughs> but, I, but I can't. Because it, to me, it's really important that we have good, trained people. Uh, just like Washington right now, there's, they were set up this training for a few people, and when they heard that there was a training, you know, we have 250 people sign up for it because they want to know. And I think it's important that old-timer like me hang around and try to get to their open minds before they're closed by uh, taking the wrong choices. So. Uh, in defense, most people, I think, try to conscientiously do a good job, but I, I think you, everybody uh, who's doing those kind of roles have to treat these, I, I tell people, like a homicide. It might be a lowly sheep, but if we don't get it right at the ground level and we don't determine what killed that sheep for sure, then everything you do beyond that is a mistake. It's a domino effect. So I keep harping on it, and hopefully I'm winning. So what number of wolves now keeps them off the endangered species list, and do you think that's the right number? Well, if you get down to rock bottom again, we're talking uh, 150 in each state. So 450 wolves in about uh, 45 breeding pairs keeps them delisted. Mm -hmm. and so that's, that's a high enough number? Um, it's a bare minimum, I think. Mm -hmm. There could have been a lot more wolves, and, and a lot of people feel that the numbers were set too low at the start. Of course, it's all hindsight now. Um, it's just squeaking by, I think, with 450. Back in the, uh, when we were talking about it a couple of years ago before delisting, there, for a while there was sort of a formula out there, or, or a, um, I don't even know where it started, but they were talking like 550 in Idaho, 450 in Montana, 350 in Wyoming. And I think there was a time that they were even discussing this, you know, the advocates versus uh, people, you know, livestock industry and legislators and congressmen. To me, that if I was Solomon, those are the numbers I'd have picked. 550, 450, 350. Anything over that's, uh, you know, frosting. Any other questions? One corollary to that one. Um, so, would it take active uh, within the respective state legislatures to increase those numbers as just for like the state's wolf management plans, or um, it is that number ever going to change based on like some sort of federal ruling? I don't ever see the numbers going up unless we have a whole other legislature because. Uh, the Idaho plan, you know, talked about, um, you were talking about the 150 wolves, 10 breeding pair. Uh, I believe around 2008, there was another new plan for, I think, 550 wolves. Uh, I forget how many breeding pairs. And, I, and for a while, that was going to be the new, the new plan, which is kind of what I agreed with. And then uh, there were some lawsuits, some hard feelings. Uh, there was delays in delisting, and uh, the state of Idaho says, the deal's off the table, no new plan, we go back to the old plan. So now Idaho is saying 152 wolves, 15 breeding pair, and we're willing to take them down to, you know, 
153 if we can do it. But I don't think they're going to be able to. And the other thing I talk about legislatures too is, is just like uh, when, when Wyoming delisted wolves, over 80% of the state of Wyoming is a free, open and free fire zone. The legislature calls them predators again. They don't have any protection. So you can go down and two-thirds of, of uh, three-fourths of Wyoming and kill wolves year-round by whatever legal means you want. So you can go down there this summer and go varmint shooting and shoot wolves. Doesn't mean that Idaho and Montana can't follow suit down the road and say, ah, oh, you know, we really don't want them east of highway so-and-so, so we'll just kill those out. And uh, you know, you can start putting more and more zoning and parameters on them. And so, yes, you can, you can uh, take, away, take away protections and make it easier and easier, and maybe cumulatively, it could be harmful. But I just don't see the states politically raising those numbers. I worry you out. Any other questions? So um, you said you had you didn't pick on conservation groups very much, but you definitely said that there were some who tended to um, uh, make the wolves seem like seem angelic. But I'm wondering, are there conservation groups or pro wolf groups that you feel are sane and reasonable that that you respect their approach and philosophy? Well. First of all, to say I'm a conservationist, I'm not a preservationist. Okay. So when, when I think it's unrealistic to have groups who say, hands off, no hunting, no trapping, no control of problem wolves. Uh, that, to me, it's unreasonable and untenable. So I don't see us even going there. But again, I think a lot of the conservation groups are, are looking for that happy medium, that 550 <coughs> wolves in Idaho, and if the state says, yeah, 550 is the floor, or anything above that, we're gonna hunt them and trap them and, and control them and whatever. And I think a lot of conservation groups, I'm going out on a limb saying this, I don't belong to any of them, okay. but I think a lot of them would say, that's good enough for us. But the reason I don't pick on the conservation groups, not the preservationists, the conservation groups as much is, um, they're not trying to get wolves killed by whatever means is legal or illegal. I mean, there's a lot of these groups, if you get on these blogs, they're telling you to shoot, shovel, and shut up. They're telling you that, uh, you know, that antifreeze makes good canine poison. Uh, you know that a lot of these insecticides put in meat, meatballs, will kill wolves. So there's, there's this promotion of illegal killing, and then, of course, the, the legal promotion of killing wolves. So I don't pick on conservation groups because they're not taking a resource saying, let's cut it all down, let's eradicate it, let's get rid of it and all of that. But this other side, that kind of vitriol uh, makes me outspoken. So, so at the end of the day, why, why do you think it's important to have wolves in the landscape? Why is it worth all the tension and political fighting for you? Well, I'll just speak from my personal view. I see nothing but positive about wolves. Um, they're native species. They were once here, we killed them all. Are these different that we put here from Canada? No. I, I've read a lot of history on wolves. They're a big male is about 125 pounds, female 85, 90 pounds. Uh, we can go on and on. Uh, if you want a cool summer, go out in a tent, camp up on a ridge top, get away from running water, you know, that makes all that racket. But it's pretty aesthetic down there. I just love camping out and hearing wolves howl. I just think that is one of the, one of the coolest sounds in nature, next to coyotes and Canada geese and sandhill cranes and all the rest. Uh, they're nothing funner than Jenny and I a few years ago watched 14 wolves on an elk kill one day and it's up there in that uh, Bear Valley country, right on the edge of the Frank Church. Watched them all morning. A couple of bow hunters were in there in their camel that bow season and uh, we were all having a grand day watching that. Uh, look at what's going on in Yellowstone, now, there's a lot of ecological things happening there. Do wolves get all the credit? Maybe not, but certainly they're essential in making prey sharper, you know, calling the herds, uh, making them uh, smarter, I think, you know, the elk. Uh, 
maybe in Yellowstone they're protecting the vegetation by running this game off of it and uh, instead of looking like a golf course there's stuff growing back. So uh, if you like to take pictures, fabulous, sneaking up on wolves. So uh, I see nothing but a positive. Uh, I hunt. I'm a gun owner, I'm a hunter. Jenny and I went hunting elk this year, it took me a whole day and a half to kill an elk uh, in wolf country. Uh, they're out there, if you can't get an elk, that ain't because of a wolf, that's because of you. So uh, I'm one to tell you there's a lot of good things about wolves and I can't really name too many bad things. I sympathize with livestock producers, I sympathize with people with wolves in their backyard. Uh, it does make them worry. They have genuine fear of what that can do to them. And some people are affected by wolves, but they don't affect me. All right, well, um, thanks again, Carter Neumeyer, for coming. <laughs>